Well, good morning, everyone. Nice to see you. Today I'm going to talk about the call. The topic is the call. And this is taken from Chapter 1 of Teachings of Christ, Volume 4, titled Resurrection of Christ. This is such a beautiful topic. And I want you to think with me how throughout your life you have made huge changes regarding marriage, career, family, children, education. And you've made huge changes on the inside also, all in response to some prompting that you envisioned or you heard or you just felt. You may have been fully conscious of that prompting or not very conscious at all. You just felt like that was the right thing to do. Everything felt right and it happened. And in thinking about this, I thought how interesting it is that all of us, when the telephone rings, we jump to it. Do you remember in the old days when telephones were hooked up to the walls? <laughs> and when the phone rang, there was one phone in the whole house, and everybody would say, I got it! And they would run to the phone, because it was really important to receive that call. And things changed and moved on. We had message machines, so we didn't have to run to the phone. But nevertheless, as soon as we came home, that blinking red light was a signal that somebody cared. Somebody called and left a message. And it was so nice to have an actual message on the other end rather than just another bleep. And things moved on even more from there, and we have call waiting. People had two lines on their phone, and they'd say to you, can you hold a second? I have to get the other call. Do you remember those days mm -hmm. when you got so annoyed that you were put on hold and you needed to just say a few things? Well, things progressed even more, and we have caller ID. You don't have to pick up the phone if it's not somebody you want. And now we have little phones, and our noses are in it day and night, and we can't wait to get that message, to respond to that text. Some people, of course, pay no attention to it whatsoever. They never call back, they never make a message. But all in the whole, we want to respond to that call. Have you ever watched a cat or a dog when they hear something? Their ears are like an antenna, they go in and out like this. Have you ever seen that? Their ears actually move according to where the sound is coming from. I find that fascinating because we do the same thing. When we hear a sound, we turn to identify it, don't we? Or we may move a little bit in one direction or the other to identify it. So we are inherently programmed to listen to the call, whatever that is. And now we have callers from everywhere. We have 24-7 calls, messages, internet, all kinds of devices that can keep us busy 24-7. And now we have to, more than ever before, learn to distinguish between the real call and the annoying ones. And that's really, really important. And it's not just a matter of having caller ID. It's a matter of having internal caller ID where you know when a message comes to you that it's the right message from the right place. Because we have all kinds of messages, don't we? Culturally, we have many messages that come from inside of us, message from the outside, message from advertisements. So we have to really be even more discerning now than ever before because we have internal callers, outside callers, all kinds of callers, all vying for our attention. Now this brings me to another realization, which is we are in continuous dialogue with the universe, aren't we? Continuously, whether we are conscious or not, the universe is talking to us. People are talking to us. We have inner promptings and dreams and images and visions. So we are in continuous dialogue. So at the time of resurrection, the whole question becomes to become more conscious of the kind of dialogue you are having, the kinds of calls you are getting, and how you are responding to them. Because the entire topic is all about the call, the great call that will change your life forever. Do you realize, if you look back on your life, how many hundreds of decisions you have made at every turn that have taken you in a completely different direction? If you just sit and look on all the decisions you've made in your life and what they have been a response to and how they changed your life. 
So this is a very important topic for us to know that we are in dialogue, we are in communication always, and to be more conscious about it. So the first thing I'm going to do is read this entire first paragraph. It is so beautiful on page 11. If you have this book or you don't have it, get it and read it. It is really an inspiring chapter to read at this time. It starts with, Master Morya emphasizes that resurrection is the answer to a great call. I never thought of resurrection that way, that it's a response to a great call. As you all know, in esoteric wisdom, Master Morya is the first ray master whose ashram prompts all the great teachings of the 20th century, has prompted rather, and maybe continues to prompt, we don't know. So it's prompted these great esoteric wisdoms to come out of his ashram, and he is really, when he says resurrection is the answer to a great call, it's a very pithy statement that includes a lot of information in it, to a great call. Resurrection is the answer to a great call. There's an answer and there's the call. What is that? And what is that great call? The great soul of this planet who was called the Father by Jesus and by many, many masters is calling back his sons. So when we get a call, it's not for us to buy something. When we get that call, it is to go back. Did you ever think of it that way? To go back to your source, to your home, to your Father, to the universe that is really you, to become one with that. He is calling us back like a man standing on the mountaintop and calling his lost son to come back. There's something really important there. First, lost. Are we so lost? Sometimes we're very lost. We really don't know. And sometimes we feel like we are on the right track. But where is that taking us? We might not know in a couple of years where that's taking us. But the other key here is we are the sons and daughters. We belong to the Great One. We are not just strangers. There is something really intimate there when we see that that sound is calling the son, the daughter, back home. Did you ever think of yourself as a son or a daughter of the Most High? You may belong to your earthly father or mother, but in reality you don't belong to any of the earthly parents. Your children don't belong to you, right? Your husband and wife don't belong to you. We all belong to the One. And imagine what that means if people of all religions and races came together to visit their father. How silly will our differences look? If we all sat together and said, we are back to our dad's house. How silly our differences. And we can look at each other and say, we all responded to that call together. Isn't that beautiful? Now listen to this. His voice, very esoteric, is tracing the path like a tracer, tracer bullet, a trace, an energy current that is tracing the path. Look at what that means. So when you are zeroing in with your inner guidance system okay, to that path, you zeroing in, you can't go wrong. You will just keep looking for those crumbs, those static maybe, that clear sound. You might veer to the right or to the left, but that clear sound, if you can hear it, will always take you back home. Isn't that beautiful? So consider on your journey, when you're lost, when you're confused, when you don't know what step to take, is to listen to that inner voice. This is in all esoteric wisdoms. Listen to that silence within you, that inner voice, and that will tell you exactly where to continue. But there has to be an inner uh, state of calm and being for us to listen to that path. Now, this is the path which leads us to resurrection. How does that do that? Listen to this. Hearing, listening to the voice and being able to listen to that voice and answering that voice is the technique, is the process of resurrection. That is so beautiful. Let me enlarge on that. Hearing. Can we hear the voices that talk to us? Do we hear what they really say? Do we hear the innuendo, the inner passion? It's not the continuous chatter that he's talking about. It's that one little voice. So first of all, we have to have hearing. Not just the outside hearing, but the inside hearing. 
Are we hearing with our heart? Are we hearing with our solar plexus? Are we hearing from our past wounds and hurts? Listen to what is, this is saying. Because if, unfortunately, we have been brought up in strict religious upbringings, as much as I love all religions, sometimes religious upbringings put a tremendous amount of guilt and suffering on us. And when we respond from that guilt and suffering and pain, we, we don't really hear the voice. We hear it as a punishment. We hear it as scolding, right? And it's not. It's just saying, come back. That's all it's saying. And you say, but I thought you said I was bad. I was a sinner. No, that's not what I'm saying, the voice will say. That's not what I'm saying at all. I'm just calling you back. And take those steps. So first we have to hear it. We have to hear it with our heart and soul and our truth, not clouded by all the coats of armor that we've developed throughout our life. And lifetimes, all our patterns come back with us over and over. And so in order to hear, we have to clear it up. Clear the deck and say, what am I hearing? It is the same as when you listen to your spouse, your children, your best friend, and he or she says, you're not hearing me. You're not hearing what I'm saying. Why is that? Because you are hearing from your prejudice, not from the way they are really speaking to you. And in the best kind of communication that you are going to have is to hear with an open heart, without prejudice, and say, what are you really saying to me? I want to hear what you have to say. And so that what happens? You affirm that person and what that person is saying to you, and you make that person alive. When we hear the voice of God, the voice of the Father, we are affirming that existence. We hear you. I hear you, you say. And isn't that the best thing you can say to someone you love? When they say the same thing over and over and over, you turn around and say, I heard you already. And say, why didn't you say that the first time? That's all I needed to hear is that you heard me. Isn't that the truth? Have you had that happen to you? Of course. We repeat and repeat and repeat. Imagine how often God repeats. Imagine every minute how often the great ones repeat how we should change our life. And we say, we heard you, we heard you. We didn't. So that's the first step, is hearing. So from here on, during this Holy Week, and Holy Week isn't just the previous week, it really is the Holy Year from now until next year. So think of your life as a Holy Year and see how you can hear your Beloved. Starting from your beloved at home, your children, your spouse, your beloved friends, hear them and affirm what they're saying so that they feel validated. Yes, she heard me. He heard me. Isn't that the most beautiful thing for somebody to hear us? Now, the next one is listen to the voice. Listen to the innuendo. Listen to the message. Listen to what is that voice telling you. Not with prejudice, again. If we have a lot of wounds and hurts, we will listen with that prejudice. Do you mean I am bad? No, that's not what I said. So you're going to listen to the voice and see what is really telling you. And one of the most beautiful ways to learn how to listen is through meditation, where you meditate deeply and then you ask your solar angel, what are you telling me? And whenever people do that, they say to me, wow, I never heard that before. So the solar angel, being a representative of God or the Father, is telling us something every minute. We have heard in the esoteric wisdom that the solar angel is in continuous meditation, trying to connect with us and have us return to that soul consciousness. And so we are going to listen to that voice now, being able to listen to that voice and answering that voice. Answering that voice. Isn't that important? So your beloved talks to you. You say, okay, I heard you. And then the beloved says, and? You say, oh, am I supposed to do something with that? Yes, you're supposed to do something with that. So you can see stage by stage, it could take us an entire lifetime to learn this. But we start with our families, with our loved ones, how to hear, acknowledge, affirm, and then do something about it. Actually taking the steps. And when we take the steps, it is the process of resurrection. What is that voice telling us? It is telling us to shape up, to become pure, to forgive, right? To develop deep compassion and virtues, 
That's what it's telling us. So it's not a mystery, it's not a secret what that voice is telling us. You all know that. All of you know what the voice is telling you. Now all you have to do is affirm it and respond to it. As you listen and you hear that voice, step by step you orient yourself. So think of that voice coming in a straight line and you're all over the map. You're all over. But if you tune in and realign yourself, step by step you are going to take that step to the great resurrection. What is that resurrection? In the esoteric wisdom it is called the seventh initiation. It's huge, but it's doable. What's the first initiation? Control over your physical life, physical vehicle. Second one, emotional. Emotional control and purity. Third one, mental control and purity. And then it goes to the intuitional. Fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. By the time you finish seventh, you have complete mastery over the entire planetary existence. Imagine, seen and unseen forces, thoughts, feelings, plans, they're all under your command. You can see them in multi-levels. And you hear the voice at that point, or even a greater one. Maybe the solar logos are even greater. So that call never stops. And you have completely aligned yourself to where that voice is taking you. You find the right path to climb this mountain. It's really interesting. I thought about climbing mountains. And how do you determine which path to take on a mountain? A really experienced climber will know. They will know exactly which path to take that will be safe, will be satisfying, and will take you to the right place, right? You can't just helter-skelter run around the mountain. You have to know which path to take. And that's the same thing in esoteric wisdom, in your spiritual upbringing. You can't just do every path. Any path, you have to decide. You have to decide the shortest, safest, most direct way to go to the top. Sometimes you have to take some circuitous routes to be safe. So you have to know how to navigate that mountain. What about this gap? Imagine you're hiking on a mountain, you are striving in your life and there's a big gap. It's a free fall. And you think, how in the world am I going to manage the change from here to there? How am I going to do that? Do I jump? Do I paddle across? Do I crawl? What do I do? What do I do in my life? Have you ever faced that? The big gap in your life where you just don't know? What do you have to do at that time? You don't just struggle aimlessly. You stop in silence and you observe. What is the most natural way to cross this gap? What is the natural way to close this gap between me and the destination? And you try it. And you listen again and again for that instruction that is coming to you. Instinctively you will know. People who are very comfortable in the outdoors are instinctive. They're not rushing about with their backpacks, running up and down trying to find the right route. They'll be exhausted if they do. In fa in, instead, they don't they? They stop and they observe. What is going on? Where is that gap that could be a dangerous? That, these precipices. Do we have pres precipices in our life? Dangerous places that we can fall and injure ourselves? Of course we do. So you have to know how to navigate those. You have to look. Is there a path that somebody took before me that I could take? Is there maybe a wild animal path that I can take? Is there maybe a water that's running downhill that I can maybe take and that would be safe for me to take? All of these things in our life we have to figure out. Is that decision the right one? Is that decision the right one or that step? We have to decide by listening to the voice. You discover how to penetrate these forests. When you listen to that voice and respond to that call, you learn how to penetrate these forests. Imagine a deep, dark forest where you don't know where north, south, east, west is. Tall trees and you don't know how to get out of that forest. Have you ever been like that in your life? Whether it's a real forest or an emotional forest, mental forest, physical forest, you just don't know how you're going to find your way out. What do you do? You don't just run in any direction. You stop. You quiet down. You try to see if you can see any stars, the sun coming out, 
See if you can get to a clearing so you can see what the environment looks like, right? Look at the metaphors in all of these that's being used here. The call tracing you back home, and then you're going through this climbing process. And as you're climbing, you're learning about the terrain, you're learning about your strength, you're learning what to carry on your back and not to carry, you're learning when to take breaks, you're learning how to stay calm and tune yourself with the environment so that you can get there safely. Do you see the metaphors that are involved in this? It's really beautiful. It's really, really beautiful. And if you, next time you go hiking, you go walking in the, in the wilderness or in the park, just think about these metaphors and what they mean and how they really translate into your life. Just take that minute and see, what is it in me that is the precipice? What is in me that's the gap that I have to navigate across? And how do I do that? How do I do that naturally and normally in my physical life and how to translate that into the emotional and mental life? So you learn where to go, that you reach the summit and find your father. You want to find that summit, that clearing, from where you will see 360 degrees and you'll be able to see the terrain, you'll be able to see where you came from, you'll be able to see others coming up and light the way for them. Isn't that beautiful? So think of it that way. Now actually the resurrection ceremony is meeting the Father, nothing else. Isn't that something? So we think in our churches that the resurrection ceremony is being nailed to the cross, and then what happens? It's actually finally opening that door and going in to meet the Father. Isn't that amazing if you think about that? What an amazing moment that would be that I have hungered and thirsted for this meeting and finally I am there. I am able to open those doors, remove all the blockages, and I am one with the Source. It's beautiful. Today the whole Christian world is celebrating Easter, whether or not they are emphasizing the deeper meanings of this great festival or great day, it doesn't matter. Because everywhere they are emphasizing the spirit of resurrection, which means they are focusing the minds of humanity toward immortality. That's why we celebrate Easter, whether it's in a religious sense, or it's an esoteric wisdom sense, or if you just have your children pick up eggs and have egg baskets, it doesn't matter. They are all thinking of that imagery, that symbology of cracking through our limitations and resurrecting. And that's the beauty of Easter, and it teaches us that matter does not hold us back. So when we read in the scriptures that Christ actually rose after he was dead, and rose and appeared to everyone that there, nothing can hold him back. Can we say that? Nothing can hold us back? I think as we mature, less and less things hold us back. So I want you to reflect on that. Maybe five years ago, ten years ago, a few little bugs may have held you back. But now those bugs don't hold you back. Maybe other things do. But I want you to see how you have already resurrected. Already a lot of steps. Maybe from last year you've overcome something and you've moved toward a new place. That's already a resurrection. So don't think of it as one prize that you get only one time in your life. We are continuously resurrecting. That's another thing I want us to remember, continuously resurrecting. And it is really important that we think about these things at this time because the whole world has that energy of resurrection. Just like at Christmas, you get into that Christmas spirit of celebration, holy night, you sing and you have that feeling of Christmas, it's the same thing during Easter. Millions and millions of people all over the world in many different Christian traditions celebrate this one thing, the resurrection over our matter. Okay. Now, the form is surpassed and the light principle in all kingdoms is touched and with that light the initiate is united. So I want you now to take it to the next step, that you have made all those steps, opened that door, and united with the Father, but you have also united with everyone else who's there. You have united with the energetic component of the entire world. Isn't that beautiful? 
And what are the steps that lead us to the seventh initiation? Is there any hope for us? Do you think it is possible for us to reach the seventh degree initiate, at least in the far future? Yes, the teaching tells us, every step counts. Every single step that you take, large or small, doesn't matter. I remember once when we were doing fundraising, a friend of mine said, <clears throat> there is no large or small donation. It's all good. And to me, I feel the same way with that faith and optimism of the future. I say every step that we take is toward that great resurrection. There are two steps discussed in this chapter that are beautiful that I'd like you to think about in these next coming weeks and months. And the first step is told us by the Tibetan master. The first step is to strive and enter into the path of resurrection by exercising your highest willpower on your personality. I bet you never thought about that. Your highest willpower on your personality. I was listening to a great neurosurgeon on television, on a television program, and he was talking about the normal things that we've heard now in the last 10, 15 years about brain health, mental health, and so on. But the one thing that he said that impressed me was, you have to develop willpower if you want real mental and brain health. And I thought, really? Willpower? I've heard about that. And here it is again. So if you think of all the things that you want to do, it's that willpower component that has to be continuously activated and grown in your life so that you achieve that. Do we have willpower? You bet we do. Ask any little child and see how much willpower that child has. And we try to crush it. We try to crush it instead of saying, yeah, go ahead, exercise that willpower and let's see you take it into greater will because it is that willpower that's going to have a stick to our diets, our health programs, our emotional purification and clarity, our meditation. We have to make these things priority in our life and drive it with our willpower. So how do you do that? This is very typically Torkum. He says, not by playing with them, but by cutting them. Things that you don't like, he says, you take a sword and cut it. That's the willpower. It's not pretty please anymore at this point. If you want to hear that voice, you have to take that knife that you use when you're walking through the jungles and you cut your path. You cut through. Okay, you take out any hindrance, anything that stops in your way. With these little steps, you are building the tubes, the electronic tubes within your system, so that when they are complete, you can start taking the message from your father to you. Do you see that? You are making a path by all the steps that you take to clearly hear that message, that call that's coming to you. And that message is coming. It's not a slow process, the teaching tells us. It comes every minute. So remember, it's not something you have to wait and do a special ceremony. It's coming to you and at you every minute. And so you, all you have to do is hear it. The most important thing is for the individual to try these things and practice them. This is the best day. The best day is during today, Easter, because the great festival of resurrection has a magnetic quality. Okay? Magnetic quality. If on this day you make a decision, your decision can be amplified by the visions and strivings of millions of people around the world and you can conquer. That is why I believe consciously we make these decisions during the Holy Days, don't we? We take that keynote of Christmas, of Easter, of our birthday, of Waysak, or whatever, the full moon. We take that keynote and we make a conscious decision and it's amplified. It carries energy and power with it. What's the second step? I'll talk about this and then give you a few minutes to do a quiet meditation on your own. The second step is really beautiful and it is building the Antankarana. Antankarana in esoteric language is that pipeline, that bridge, that path that you build, step by step that you take, that will take you eventually to your source. It is that consciousness that you build. And you see that year by year when you meditate, you think, and you do the, the work on the virtues, and you'll see that slowly, slowly, 
you are becoming more together, you are really clearly on that path. And not many things can take you out of that. You're really clear about what you're doing. So slowly the disciple cultivates continuity of consciousness. Don't you want to be having that continuity of consciousness that when you sleep you are completely conscious of the higher worlds and when you meditate you are completely conscious of the higher worlds? Isn't that something that we want? When we want to be in touch with someone we love, they don't have to be sitting next to us. We just go there. It's beautiful. What a beautiful thing that would be to have that continuity of consciousness. And that's exactly what the word antankarana means. It is the bridge of the consciousness built between us and the soul, the solar angel, higher ashrams, and so on. That's the bridge, that continuity that we want to build. How do we do that? Two steps are given here that are very, very important. And in my experience, these steps have to be the most important thing that you do on any given day. Any given day. They have to be the most important because they are truly the most important. One of them is meditation. The other one is self-examination and review at the end of the day. If these two things are the most important thing in your life, I guarantee you your life will change. It will change months, a year later, two years later, you will see a different response mechanism inside you. You'll see yourself calmer, more reticent, more responsive to life. You really hear your loved ones. You hear that higher voice. You distinguish between voices. It's not that you don't have any fun or anything in life anymore, but you are focused. You're determined. You have a purpose and a direction in your life. So meditation is the first one. Learn how to meditate. All of you here know how to meditate, and I'm very proud to say that all of you do. It's really, really beautiful that you take time every single day to take that quiet time for yourself and do meditation. You look over your day and if something hurts your heart, it's not right with you or right with someone you love, you make it right. And that's really the two important things that you're constantly adjusting. And look, if you look at it from the perspective of that tracer that came to you, what are you doing? You are constantly adjusting yourself, aren't you? You're making yourself right with the principles of the great teachings. Constantly adjusting, forgiving, letting go, remove prejudices, instill more self-confidence, healing inside of yourself. And that's what's so important for us to do. So at this time of Easter, I think it's really, really important to remember the words of Christ when he said, greater things you will do. Isn't that beautiful? So a great one says, greater things you will do. And that's a promise for us. It's a promise that we can do what he did. He came way before us. And in 2,000 years, humanity has changed a lot. And we are really different than people were 2,000 years ago, don't you think? Very, very different. And we can listen to that call in a more sophisticated way than people did 2,000 years ago. So let's take a few minutes and do this meditation about the call. And after that, we will have communion. Close your eyes and sit very in a very relaxed way and think of a voice calling you. And think about this topic that I just talked about and what impressed you the most in that information that you would like to take home with you and think about share with your loved ones. What is the call that you can trace back that put you on a journey of self-discovery that made the greatest change in your life? Can you recall that impression? Try to find it and just relive it.
Can you trace back that call to many little mini calls that you heard through your growing years and how you have responded to them one by one? Now go deep into your wisdom and ask the solar angel, what do I need to hear now? Where do I need to go with my life to have it deeper and more meaningful from here on? See if you can discern that message. Keeping your focus on your solar angel, repeat after me. Lead us, O Lord. Lead us, O Lord. From darkness to light. From darkness to light. From the unreal to the real. From the unreal to the real. From death to immortality. From death to immortality. From chaos to beauty.